interesting uh, piece. Not really that interesting, but it's telling. Maybe that's a better description. Telling piece from University of Baltimore law professor Kimberly Wheel over in the Hill. And she chalks up uh, the uh, Bragg prosecution of Trump in Manhattan, as well as the uh, Smith uh, prosecution of Trump in D.C. as um, just novel applications of existing law. And as she writes, to shy away from applying old law to new facts can produce travesties of justice. It's not the other way around. And Bragg's case was no different. She would say the same, and she does, essentially, about uh, Jack Smith using a provision from Sarbanes-Oxley, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, which was a response to the Enron corporate accounting scandal uh, for uh, Trump's prosecution over the events of J6. And, you know, what you need to apply, so I guess it would be argued, uh, old laws to new facts in novel ways when your democracy is at stake. As we continue to argue, the ends justify the means when you have to save America from Donald Trump. Here's Mr. Tingle himself on Morning Joe yesterday. He wants to put them all in jail. He's unbelievable the way he talks about his opponents. And, and this is exactly the choice we have, a dictatorship or a democracy. We have to choose. This election is about more than abortion. It's about the whole question of what kind of government we're going to have. What kind of a country do we want to live in? Do we want a dictator who will tell the U.S. Congress, don't do anything about the border? Just don't do anything. Let it rock and roll. Let thousands come through between now and Election Day. It doesn't matter if they stay here forever, as long as we win the election. He's talking to, he's going to talk like that to the Supreme Court. He would love to see them give him immunity. He'd love to get that. He's probably still counting on it in this trial in New York, too, about the, the, uh, the hush money. He's probably working right. up some backroom plan to somehow get speed this to the Supreme Court and let the Alito in that incredible coup they pulled up there against Judge Roberts. I mean, Alito is running the show. He is so wrong on a number of levels. So it's going to be uh, the dictatorship, it turns out. It's going to be a junta. It's going to be a Trump and Alito. Um, I'm not sure who else uh, Chris Matthews has in mind for this uh, takeover. But this, the ends justify the means because we're facing the prospect of a dictatorship. So. And why is he back on the air? Didn't he have his Me Too moment? So um, applying old laws to new facts in novel ways is the least we can do given the threat that we face. Hmm. Uh, for more on this, we're pleased to be joined by Harvey Silverglate. He's a criminal defense and civil liberties lawyer. He's co-founder of the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education. And he's the author of the uh, bestseller, which you've talked about before, Three Felonies a Day, How the Feds Target the Innocent. Harvey Silverglate, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Good to be on. So um, <clears throat> what do you make of that, uh, particularly the legal argument from the law professor? So all we have here is, again, uh, the campaign finance business records. Those are laws, and it was taking new facts to old laws in novel ways to produce justice. <clears throat> well, this is an old trick of prosecutors. Um, <clears throat> you, know the, the, you know the old adage that, uh, a federal prosecutor can indict a ham sandwich. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> well, that's what they're just doing, and it's been done for a long time. And, and federal law has an even more serious problem, and that is its vagueness. Um, the way federal law is constructed <clears throat> is as follows. The feds under the Constitution do not have general criminal um, uh, authority. Uh, the old common law, you know, theft and um, murder and, uh, and the ordinary crimes. Um, there is no jurisdiction over these. There are specific hooks for federal jurisdiction. Uh, a crime that's committed through, by the means of interstate commerce or communication, for example, um, across state lines. 
or uh, a crime that's committed by the use of the U.S. mails or the phone because that goes interstate. Um, and so it sounds like limited jurisdiction, but it's really not because it's very hard to find crimes these days that don't involve use of a telephone, use of the mails, use of going across state lines. So contrary to the, what the founding fathers intended, the feds have an enormous amount of jurisdiction. And that's not the worst of it. The worst of it, in my view, is the vagueness of these statutes. What is a fraud for the federal purposes? It's not bound by the traditional common law notion of fraud. And again, that's why the saying arose, the feds can indict a ham sandwich. And it's even worse than that because the feds have a system for interviewing witnesses and interviewing the potential targets for prosecution that works like this. Two federal agents show up at your home or your office or wherever, and they, they're going to interview you about a suspected crime. You say um, – that you want your lawyer there. So say, okay, so they uh, they have to allow you a lawyer. It's right in the Constitution. Now you're sitting in a room at the FBI office or the lawyer's office, <clears throat> and um, the uh, interview is about to begin. And what I uh, always do is I pull out a tape recorder, where now it's not a tape recorder. It's now an electronic recorder. And the feds say, well, you'll have to put that away. I say, well, well why? And, of course, I know the answer, but the answer is always the same. There is an actual federal regulation that prohibits the agents from conducting an interview if it's recorded. And um, I, um, I say, well, I'm sorry, but I have my own regulation, and I will not allow a client to be interviewed without my recording it for accuracies as well. We type up a report afterwards called a Form 2. Mm -hmm. That's why we have two agents. One takes notes. The other one does the questioning. And we'll give you a copy of the 302. I say, well, the problem is I've been doing this for a long time, and I've never seen an accurate 302. (laughs) Yeah, it's a problem. The tape recorder happens to be uh, quite accurate. And then they get up and leave. So this is a totally corrupt agency. It got a bad start with J. Edgar Hoover, and it has never really gotten better. People think that when Hoover died, the agency suddenly had a, uh, had a had plastic surgery. Not true. It is the same corrupt agency. It should be abolished. All of the agents should be fired. Uh, and if the feds need an investigative agency for general criminal purposes, it, a Congress should create a new one, and it should be a set up so that these regulations go by the uh, the way of the dodo bird. It's really quite serious. Well, well one of the things that um, was a, a, a main takeaway from your book, Three Felonies a Day, uh, is, it, it, you know, you're sort of getting to it, the, the vagueness of the law. And if the law is unknowable, then you don't have the rule of law. Well, in the Trump case in the in Manhattan, the charges were unknowable uh, for most of the trial, in addition to the novel, to be generous, uh, use of old laws for new facts. Oh, yeah. I mean, so, so uh, you know, I mean, that, that this is really something that um, extends uh, beyond the federal law to state law, too, in terms of unknowable law means no rule of law. It means uh, basically rule of men because the prosecutor can decide. Uh, what it means and the application of it, depending on his particular disposition to a particular defendant. Yes, we're all vulnerable. It just depends on whom the prosecutor wants to get today. And uh, my prediction is if the appellate courts have any integrity left, and I think the appellate courts do, the trial courts are really problematic right now. But um, if the appellate courts have any integrity this conviction of Alvin Briggs is going to be wiped out on appeal. I just don't see, I don't see the crime. I don't, I just don't see it. And I've been doing this for since 1967 when I entered the bar. 
Um, and the, uh, uh, the, the Hunter Biden trial, uh, the criminal referrals yesterday for Hunter and for uh, brother Jim for essentially uh, lying to Congress. Um, what's your review of those prosecutions, too, just in terms of some even handedness here? In well, the if, analysis? His last name wasn't, if his last name wasn't Biden, I suspect that prosecutorial discretion would not have him in, indicted. You know, if we invite indict everybody who creates a who, who commits a technical crime, the entire country will be in prison, including the prison guards. I mean, yeah, but didn't they do these look, charges to get to something bigger? Excuse me. Didn't they do, bring these charges against him to get more access to the laptop to see if there's anything nefarious going on between? Oh yes. Large oh, payments yes. being paid to the Bidens for no work. Yep. Ulterior motive. And you know, I represent John Eastman in, in Georgia uh, and uh, in Arizona. And he committed no crime either. He's going through agony having to get millions of dollars for defense costs because the, the, the charges in Georgia alone it will take a year and a half and several million dollars to prepare. And the trial will go on for over a year. She's got a huge, a whole army indicted, and um, it's a it's a RICO a racketeering statute. So you know, the, the obviously one of the intentions is to uh, is to make it financially impossible for some of these people to defend themselves. I mean, you you you've got, and that case is now stayed because of Fannie Willis got herself into a problem having her boyfriend. In, be the special prosecutor to earn several million dollars. And you can't make this up. Everywhere you look, there is unfairness, there's corruption, there's unconstitutional prosecutions. You know, it's, it's, it, it, I'm no fan of Trump. I didn't vote for Trump. But fairness is fairness, and the law is the law. The Constitution is the Constitution. And uh, you should not uh, utilize these kinds of techniques just in order to get somebody, because it'll come back and it'll bite you later. Somebody you like, and then we'll, we'll, we'll be, you know, we have a like, system of precedent. So something used in the case against somebody you don't like, the following year is going to be used against you or somebody you do like. So the whole era right now is topsy-turvy. It's, I've been, as I said, I've been doing this since 1967. I've never seen anything like this. Well, the, the the other thing, too, is the extent now of the criminalization of politics and, frankly, the decriminalization of crime, particularly violent crime. And we see this playing out in a lot of different ways. It's not just with uh, politicians or those connected to them. I mean, it's also um, just doing a little comparison contrast. Uh, 75 year old, uh, a 75 year old woman was sentenced to two years in prison uh, last week for ba basically being a, a prayer warrior outside of an abortion clinic, attempting to dissuade women from getting abortions. Um, two years in prison. Um, by contrast, uh, in, you know, violation of the, the F FACE Act, the Freedom to Access Clinic Entrances Right, which is this an in invented civil right. Um, the, um, uh, the woman who threw a Molotov cocktail at a New York City police car in 2020 was sentenced to 15 months in prison. Um, is it just, you know, the, these sort of disparities in what we see uh, in terms of what is politically important to the controlling authority, and then if you have a, an alternative viewpoint um, and you uh, are an advocate for that alternative viewpoint and anything that they think crosses the line, then they use the law to criminalize your political viewpoint. And, uh, again, uh, they... Uh, water down the law or ignore it altogether if you're a political ally who's crossed the line into illegality. Yeah. Well, what they don't realize is that this is still a democracy, you know, sometimes I think barely, but it's still a democracy. And of course, power changes hands. And what they don't realize is that in four years or eight years, they and their allies will be subject to these same Techniques, because techniques, these techniques create precedents. As a common law system based on precedent. So it'll, you know, 
the devil that they're chasing now is going to turn around and chase them. It's, it's utter stupidity. It's lack of foresight, wholly aside from the fact that it's totally unfair. Our, oh, can I just ask one real quick question? Do you think because of what happened yesterday with the uh, Georgia election interference case paused by the appeals court that there's any possibility that all the cases will be dropped? Yes. Okay. I think what will happen is that they'll all be dropped and the court will appoint somebody of undoubted integrity to reexamine these prosecutions and decide whether to bring whether to bring the charges again. And my prediction is that most of them, since they haven't committed crimes, uh, the indictments will not be brought again. And the ones that will be brought will not be the RICO cases. They will be ordinary cons- uh, conspiracy cases that will take relatively little money to, and time to prepare. That will be tried in a relatively short period of time, and that will be that. You know, if if a, this the case as it is now, the trial will last well more than a year. What does that imply for the jury? It means that the jury will be composed entirely of people who are retired, yeah. because how can a working person spend a year away from his or her job? So that means there will not be a cross section of the community. There'll be older, retired people. And, you know, you'll get certain points of view because there's no there's no generational diversity among the jury. So in so many ways, this Georgia prosecution is ill-considered. And um, I, I predict, and you can bring me back uh, after the, uh, the court has decided it, the appellate court has decided it, you can bring me back and either say that, you know, I, I was wrong, or uh, I think that I'm not going to be wrong after that. I think what I'm saying is absolutely what's going to happen. Harvey Silverglate, he is a criminal defense and civil liberties lawyer, co-founder of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, FIRE, and author of the bestseller, Three Felonies a Day, How the Feds Target the Innocent. Harvey Silverglate, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Right. Sorry it was necessary, but thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you. We appreciate your time, and he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. There's only one radio show in Chicago talking about today's biggest stories and telling you what they really mean. That show is this one. Chicago's Morning Answer on AM560, The Answer. This is Seth Leibson.